for around like 12 Thanks everyone for outside coming. Of um, okay. Today we have a presentation by Rachel Korba. It's the contract of heterologous vaccine candidate against B. avium and C. jejeen G. food poisoning utilizing the B. avium autotransporter BA1. Good job. <laughs> so like my title implies, we're working on constructing a vaccine platform combating these two bacterial species, Campylobacter jejuni and Bordetella avium. So I'm going to tell you a little more about um, these species. So first is Campylobacter jejuni. It is a gram-negative <coughs> spiral-shaped bacterium, as you can see pictured, and it is the leading cause of gastroenteritis worldwide. In other words, it's the leading, leading cause of food poisoning. Um, most people, when they think of food poisoning, you think of Salmonella, Shigella, or E. coli, but it actually causes more case, two to seven times more cases um, of food poisoning than these other species. In fact, it causes 2.4 million cases of food poisoning each year in the U.S., affecting about 1% of the United States population. Campylobacter food poisoning infections are often um, attributed to the consumption of undercooked poultry, specifically chickens and turkey. In fact, 50, per 50 to 70% of Campylobacter cases in industrialized nations like the United States, Europe, Australia, are um, attributed to chicken and turkey. It is important to note that um, both Bordetella avium and Campylobacter jeni resides in these birds. <coughs> so now I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk about a pathogen that infects turkeys, Bordetella avium. It causes a disease called Bordetellosis, which is similar to the whooping cough. Bordetella avium might sound familiar because it is related to the human pathogen Bordetella pertussis that causes whooping cough in humans. So how this works is the Bordetella avium, as you can see um, on the left, is a gram-negative uh, rod-shaped bacteria. It attaches to the ciliated epithelial cells in the turkey trachea. So it latches on and then secretes toxins to increase infection. It's important to note that bordetellosis, though it infects turkeys, it doesn't directly kill them. Morbidity is high, but mortality is low for this disease, meaning they get very sick, but it's actually a secondary pathogen, usually E. coli or some other bacterial species that comes in and kills them off. Symptoms of bordetella avium include nasal discharge, watery, pussy eyes, and snicking, which is the turkey version of coughing. It's a quite an interesting sound. Um, this disease is highly contagious between the birds and it is spread through direct contact. Um, this disease is pretty relevant to JMU because Shenandoah Valley has the largest um, commercialized turkey industry in the nation. So turkey farmers are especially looking to us to create a potential vaccine that can combat this disease because the um, current vaccine is ineffective and no one really likes to use antibiotics in a food source if they don't have to. So what do these two very different bacterial species have in common? Well, it all comes back to the turkey. Both of these reside in turkey. Um, so the Bordetella avium makes the turkey sick, and the Campylobacter jejuni, it resides in the turkeys and the chickens, but there's no way of detecting if the birds are carrying this species. So we won't know if we're consuming um, meat with um, Campylobacter that can cause food poisoning. So it's very scary if the detection methods are sound. So what can we do about this? Well, we can create a vaccine that can combat both of these and administer it to the turkey so that the turkey fights off both Bordetella and Campylobacter. So they don't get sick and we don't get sick. We would look to create this vaccine by utilizing the genetic mechanisms of Bordetella avium, that specific bacteria. Specifically, we would look to utilize the autotransporter called BA1. So what is an autotransporter? They make up the largest family of proteins in gram-negative bacteria, and they play a lot of different roles, sometimes in virulence, in um, attachment to the host cell um, in the turkey. So this picture that you see is the general structure of a membrane of a gram-negative bacterial cell. This first layer is the inner membrane, so this is down here would be the interior of the cell, and this is the outer membrane, and above that would be the exterior of the cell, the outside surface. 
So the general and um, basic structure of an auto transporter contains a beta barrel transporter domain, this blue region, and it's anchored into the outer membrane. It doesn't move. It's also important to note that this region is highly conserved across all the gram-negative species. So if you compare very different bacterial species, that protein should be very similar. This green protein, or the passenger region, is what's being secreted to the cell surface. It is the active region of the protein, and that's what's involved in virulence and host cell attachment. So that protein that's secreted is playing the major role of this protein. <coughs> what we would try to do is create a vaccine utilizing this protein. So, if we were to take out the passenger region of the Bordetella avium gene and put in a gene from Campylobacter, this would be um, the Bordetella avium region, the transporter that's anchored in the membrane, but this green protein would be a Campylobacter gene that's, turns into a, that's translated into a protein and is expressed on the cell surface. Thus, if we introduce a, this chimera of um, Bordetella avium containing the Campylobacter gene and introduce it into a turkey host, they should create antibodies for Bordetella avium and Campylobacter, effectively immunizing them against both, um, both bacterial species. Specifically, we're going to use FLA-A or CJA. Those are two Campylobacter genes. FLA-A is a flagella protein, and um, CJA is just another outer membrane protein. They're highly antigenic, meaning it's very likely that the host turkey will recognize them and create antibodies for them. So the entire goal of my project was to engineer this Campylobacter gene into the passenger domain of the BA1 autotransporter and insert or translate that um, construct into the chromosome of a Bordetella avium uh, cell because that is what would be introduced as the vaccine, as a whole cell vaccine. So the cloning strategy we used was to create a plasmid initially that looked like this. So in the, on the top you see a blue and green region. That whole region we call the promoter region because it contains the promoter for the protein. This middle region, the gray region, would be the passenger domain, and that would either contain the FLA-A or CJA insert. This bottom blue region, would, we call the transporter domain, because it has that um, wild-type BA1 transporter that would be anchored in the membrane. So what I was given when I stepped into this project was a plasma that looked something like this, but without the... Uh, flaw A or CJA passenger domain. It was these two blue regions consecutively next to each other. So what I in initially did was I took this plasmid that I was given and double digested it with these two restriction enzymes, AGE1 and NRU1 that you can see in red. So what that effectively does is opens up this circular piece of DNA and just opens it up. And then on another plasmid, we had the flaw A and CJA genes separately. I amplified them by PCR, and then I mixed the PCR product and did a ligation with this now open circular, it's not circular anymore, but it was linear, and you ligate them together to hopefully form this circular plasmid. So that way, our construct, our gene of, gene of interest is in the passenger domain. So then, once I made this ligation, I inserted this um, plasmid into E. coli by means of transformation, and then I plated them on um, auger that has canamycin, because this plasmid, you, it's not depicted here, but it has a canamycin resistance gene, meaning it will grow on plates that have that antibiotic. <coughs> Once I saw successful growth on our transformation plates, I did a colony PCR, meaning I tested different colonies and try to amplify that gray CJA region. I tried to amplify it to make sure that the ligation was successful and that my plasmid was in the bacteria. So these are um, gel electrophoresis images of that PCR. On the left lanes, you can see the ladder, which is just a standard telling you the size of your fragments. The next lane are positive controls and CJA 
has a length of 839 base pairs and flaw A has 912 base pairs. So what you're looking for is to see this exact band in the same location. If you got different bands at different sizes, that would indicate you do not have the fragment you're looking for. So out of 14 colonies that I tested, two had successfully the, had the CJA ligated into them and one had the flaw A ligated into it. So now that I had a successful construct, this was really exciting because I just put a Campylobacter gene into a Bordetella gene. So now we were able to move it into the chromosome. The reason why we have to move it into the chromosome and not keep it on the plasmid is because Bordetella avium doesn't replicate with this plasmid. If I just tried to insert it, it would uh, replicate and just die out. The plasmid would not be um, passed on. So we have to get it to cross over into the chromosome. And the way it does this is by a process called homologous recombination. Homologous recombination is most simply defined as the exchange of genetic material based on two similar or homologous regions of DNA. So this is the whole process and I'm going to use this and compare it with my plasmid that I had. So if you see the circle up at the top, you can consider that like my plasmid. The white region with some writing in the middle would be considered like my flaw A. It's, it's what I engineered into um, the BA1. The little gray regions flanking the white regions would be considered the wild type portion of my genes, the transporter and promoter regions of BA1. So with this plasmid, when I, it goes into a Bordetella cell, if it aligns with the chromosome that already has a wild type copy of the BA1 promoter, it can switch out the DNA and if effectively insert my entire plasmid into its chromosome. So now after this first crossover, it's going to contain the wild type copy of the BA1 gene, but also our mutant copy that we just engineered. Also, since we had a canamycin resistance gene on the plasmid, the chromosome will now contain a canamycin resistance gene. So the way we select for that is by applying the canamycin pressure. So the colonies that are growing on those plates should theoretically only be the colonies that had successful crossover. We verify this with PCR and gel electrophoresis, and we try to amplify our gene of interest, the Campylobacter gene. But that's not all. Homologous recombination involves a second crossover. So now that it's in the chromosome, we have to get that wild type copy out because that's not what we want. We want to construct this mutant. So because there are already homologous regions in the one chromosome, it can cross over on itself. As you see here, it loops over on itself and it crosses over on both ends and effectively either loops out the original plasmid that we tried to put in or a plasmid containing the wild type <coughs> copy of the BA1. This is a 50-50 chance. There's no rhyme or reason for which option it chooses. It's just a random loop out. So we try to screen for the colonies that um, have this, that looped out the um, wild type copy because we need to keep this construct in the chromosome. So after I did the triparental mating, which is how this homologous <coughs> recombination happens, like I said, I was looking for the canamycin resistance gene, or I'm sorry, I was looking for the um, Campylobacter gene to verify that it had gone into the chromosome. So again, you see a ladder and my positive control, and these are different colonies that I was testing um, that grew on the plate. So if they grew, like I said, they had the canamycin resistance, which implied that the Campylobacter gene <coughs> should be there. But as you can see, there are no <coughs> bands on my gel implying that it was not detectable. I tried different combinations of primers, I tried different annealing temperatures, used different enzymes, but no matter what I tried, the band was never visible. This implied that this, the construct might be unstable. As a control, <coughs> as a PCR control, we tried amplifying other regions of the Bordetella chromosome that aren't the Campylobacter genes that should be there. So this is a gel showing um, amplification of the promoter region of the BA1 autotransporter, and it's at about 250 base pairs. This is the positive control, and you can see all of my colonies did match up <coughs> with the positive control, meaning 
we could still amplify other regions of this chromosome, just not the Campylobacter region, which suggested instability. Now, it turns out that the GC content of these two species are very different. So Campylobacter has a 35% GC content, meaning of its nucleotides, 35% of those are GC. Bordetella avium has a 61%. That stark difference is a hypothesis as to why the Campylobacter gene may be unstable in the Bordetella background. So to kind of get around this instability, we um, synthesized a plasmid um, from in vitrogen and had it made for us. And this is what it looks like. So this whole blue section on the right would be the BA1 promoter with our CJA gene inserted into it. Now, how did we get around this instability? Well, when you're designing a plasmid like this and having it synthesized for you, you have the option to optimize the codon. So basically, <coughs> we brought the nucleotide GC content up to almost 60%, closer to the Bordetella um, GC content, so that it has less of a chance of um, potentially being unstable. This plasmid also contains a canamycin resistance gene as a selectable marker. So moving forward, I did the triparental mating again, and this is um, what a typical plate would look like of a triparental mating. You can see some colonies, single isolated colonies at the top of the plate, and those theoretically should have the um, plasmid in its chromosome. I took these colonies and passaged them on canamycin plates and then extracted the chromosomal DNA to verify by PCR and gel electrophoresis yet again that the Campylobacter gene was in the chromosome. So this is a gel of the verification of the first crossover, so just getting the whole plasmid into the chromosome. This is um, a PCR of one sample, but at a temperature gradient, so you can see that the temperature, of the annealing temperature ranged from 55 to 68 degrees Celsius. In this lane, you have the positive control. So this is what we're trying to match, essentially. <coughs> I was looking for a band at about 1,200 base pairs, which would be right about this height, because you can see the standard is 1,000, and I'm looking for about 1,200. That is because I was amplifying from the beginning of the CJA region to the end of the transporter region. So this whole section from this black bar to the end of the arrow should be 1,215 base pairs exactly. So what the gel showed is that in each lane, I was getting a band, a primary significant intense band that was matching up with the size that I was looking for. There are other non-specific bands that don't align, but that's just a PCR optimization issue that can be worked out later. So this was enough evidence to verify that I did have the um, construct successfully into the chromosome, and I could move forward to try and ha make the second crossover happen. And by how you do that is by removing the canamycin selection. So if you don't give the um, bacteria the canamycin to grow on, it potentially will loop out that plasmid containing the canamycin resistance gene. So this is the verification of the second crossover where it doubles over itself. Again, I was amplifying that same fragment from 1200, um, from the beginning of the CJA region to the end of the transporter region, which should be about 1200 base pairs. Again, you have the positive control lane, which worked beautifully, and that's what we're trying to amplify. I um, tested 10 different colonies this time because it's more of a rare event, so you want to uh, screen as many colonies as you possibly can. You can see in all lanes but one, there's a band that's higher than what the positive control is showing. These bands are at about 2,000 base pairs, and that's not the fragment we were looking for. However, the band at in 2-13 the primary band does line up with the chromosome at what looks to be about 1,200 base pairs. So we successfully moved a construct of BA1 containing a Campylobacter gene into the Bordetella avium chromosome. So this is really exciting because now we have something to work with and do future studies with. So essentially what I did from start to finish was I tried cloning the um, Campylobacter gene into the a uh, BA1 passenger region and did a triparental mating to try and get it to cross over into the chromosome via homologous recombination. When detection wasn't working and it didn't, wasn't in there, we synthesized the plasmid and optimized the codon 
did the triparental mating again and verified the different steps of homologous recombination with PCR and gel electrophoresis. And we have a successful transconjugate. <laughs> so for future work, now that we have this um, successful construct, we need to know that this Campylobacter protein is being expressed like we said it would. So if you recall from the beginning of the presentation, that green squiggly line being expressed, or secreted rather, to the surface of the cell, we need to test that this protein is actually being secreted. Also, we have to do in vivo infections to test that the turkey host cell, um, the turkey host is making antibodies to these two different bacterial pathogens like we, they should. And then finally, we'll do challenge studies partnered with the Virginia Maryland School of Veterinary Medicine this summer. So we're making great progress. I just want to thank Dr. Temple and my whole committee, um, all my lab mates, family, friends, and the department just for supporting me through all this. And it's, it's been three and a half years I've been working on this project, but we've come a long way. So thank you guys so much for coming. Oh, so <laughs> just give someone else another chance. Um, so how convinced are you that you really have a transconjugate, transconjugate there? Have you tested it once? Have you tested um, it? I'm pretty, I'm pretty positive, um, because that specific um, colony looked very different. And then I, um, I don't have the gel pictured here, but I ran this colony compared with one that I didn't think worked side by side and optimize the PCR a little more. And we have a, um, a cleaner band, and there is no band present at all in the lane containing. Um, I ran it with 1-15. So there are bands here, which is weird because it shouldn't have this, um, it shouldn't have this gene in it. But I ran it again and optimized the PCR a little bit. I changed the temperatures. And 1-15 um, had no bands, but 2-13 had a clear band um, at 1,200 base pairs. So I'm more confident than not that it's in there. Again, more piece, like better uh, PCR um, should be done maybe using different primers. Um, designing primers is a finicky process um, to try and amplify the region and get a clear PCR product without any um, alternative banding patterns. So have you tested the absence of the region that you want gone? Um, I know a negative result is not the greatest, but pairing it with a positive, I personally right. would feel more confident yeah. that, that what I wanted gone is really gone. Right. So um, I can't recall the sizes off the top of my head, but I do believe that the insert, um, because we removed the passenger domain, the wild type passenger domain, and then inserted the Campylobacter gene. So I think my construct is only a few base pairs longer than what the wild type gene is. So it would be really hard to detect that um, the wild type copy got removed, but I'd have to look at those sizes because... Um, Just make nested primers inside the region you want gone. Right, primers inside okay, the region that I should see. be gone, I you see. Know what I mean? Yes. And then they right, have inside the wild type passenger domain because yeah. it won't be there. Yeah. That makes sense. I just know how much how hard it was for you to yeah. get that. So <laughs> Dr. Sure Stock was on my committee. <laughs> she did she did a lot of the research like building up to my research, so she knows this project very well. <laughs> yes, Mom. How many years before your research were they working on this? <coughs> okay. Well, I know Dr. Temple's been work studying Bordetella in general. 90s, since the 90s, earlier, mm -hmm. since around the 90s. Um, Dr. Stockwell had a lot of um, the previous research that I built off of on the Ba One autotransporter <coughs> itself and what it's involved in. Um, how long ago was that, Dr. Stockwell? I don't know, 2010 maybe? 10, so came out? Mm -hmm. Seven, eight years. 2009 maybe? This project's come a long way, keeps going. There's still more to do. Any other questions? Dr. York. If you guys successfully produce the vaccine, is it something that you would patent? Or would it be? <laughs> Dr. Temple's like, and yes. how <laughs> might that affect um, the Shenandoah Valley farmers? Uh, um, 
Well, I wish I could talk to a farmer, you know, to see how it would really impact them. But I know that the current vaccine really isn't effective. Um, so they'd probably be very excited. And it, because it's not just for the turkeys. I mean, the, if, you know, their turkeys are sick, of course, it causes um, significant economic damage to, to them and their business. But um, this is also geared towards human health. So um, we want to limit the spread of um, Campylobacter um, to decrease the possible risk of food poisoning. So I'm sure overall this would be really, really helpful. Um, I'm not saying it's going to happen next year because it won't. It takes a while, but um, we're one step closer to making this work for them. So it would have to make sense. Oh, sorry. All right. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>